applied ego. Heidegger's thinking in being and time explained with Simon Critchley. Episode seven, inauthentic life. So things got a bit heavy in that last episode, maybe the last two, and um, you know, not just the hammer is heavy, but Heidegger's heavy, and it is heavy. It's also remarkably simple and obvious if you put your mind to it. But let's try and have a little bit more fun in this episode. I want to talk about inauthentic life, which I think many of us are experts uh, at in um, our day-to-day -day existence. He begins part B of chapter five. So we're still in this big chapter on being in as such. We've gone through the key existential concepts, um, state of mind, understanding, discourse. And now we're gonna find um, a set of kind of mirror concepts for those that take place in relationship to what Heidegger calls Dasein's falling. And he begins by confessing in part B that um, in all this fascinating discussion, you know, discussion of assertion, language, so on and so forth, maybe he's lost sight of Dasein's everydayness. He's lost sight of this average everyday place, which is where he started his analysis. So let's go back to that. Let's go back to publicness. Let's go back to the they. How does all this stuff that Heidegger has said, how does it, um, how does it relate to our average everyday life in the world? So we have the three existential concepts state of mind, understanding, discourse. And then we, they are mirrored in three counter-concepts, uh, which are idle talk, ambiguity, and curiosity. Idle talk, ambiguity, and curiosity. And Heidegger insists, once again, that in what follows, he's not involved in any moralizing critique of Dasein, human life. And he says, these paragraphs do not aspire to a philosophy of culture. He insists on this so much, you know, the lady doth protest too much, methinks. He protests against this so much that we can think about that. Perhaps this is a philosophy of culture. And um, maybe it's also a critique of the culture of Heidegger's day and maybe of our own. That word culture in the German philosophy of this period, Kultur, was a very uh, strong word uh, that was, at the time that Heidegger was writing Being in Time, was associated with maybe the most prominent German philosopher of this period, who was Ernst Kassira, his work on symbolic forms and other really interesting stuff. But let's stay tight to what Heidegger's saying. Idle talk, idle talk. Paragraph 35, I think this is fairly straightforward. If discourse is the disclosure of Dasein's intelligibility of our being in the world, then idle talk is the closing off of this disclosure, right? If discourse, rede, is disclosure, then idle talk, Gerede is the closing off of this disclosure. And Heidegger says, this is a, a great quote, I think. He says on 2.12, and because this discoursing, idle talk, has lost its primary relationship of being towards the entity talked about, or else has never achieved such a relationship, it does not communicate in such a way as to let this entity be appropriated in a primordial manner, but communicates rather by following the route of gossiping and passing the word along. Gossiping, passing the world word along. Idle talk is constituted by just such gossiping and passing the word along. 
a process by which its initial lack of grounds to stand on becomes aggravated to complete groundlessness. And indeed, this idle talk is not confined to vocal gossip, but even spreads to what we write, where it takes the form of scribbling. In this latter case, the gossip is not based so much upon hearsay, it feeds upon superficial reading, and it goes on. This is how oh, this is good. The average understanding will not want to make any distinction because it does not need it because it understands everything. Idle talk is gossiping, it's passing the word along, it's language employed in completely groundless ways. We can think of countless examples of this from yeah, reality TV shows to whatever examples we care to insert. In writing, it becomes scribbling. It becomes journalism. It becomes what we used to call 10 years ago, blogging. Or it becomes social media updates. It becomes, you know, you and your social media profile and your endless scribbling, updating of that. That's what Heidegger means by idle talk. And that idle talk is dominated by average understanding. And average understanding understands everything already. Everything is always already understood in the domain of idle talk. There's nothing new. Everything is known already. Think about this in relationship to a kind of our news flash or update culture that our phones are flooded with endless updates, you know, about the latest results of whatever event has happened in the world or an election or whatever. So we were always already, uh, everything is always already known. And that's a condition of public discourse, of publicness. We, and Heidegger will say, in publicness, we float. We float, unattached. Which brings us to the next concept, curiosity. This is a fascinating little paragraph, just a, just a few pages in the text, easy to ignore. But um, it begins, this is paragraph 36, with a discussion of the natural light, the lumen naturale, which Heidegger's already discussed at the beginning of chapter five, when he's talking about disclosure and the clearing and the fact that we are not lit up. The natural light is not the natural light of reason, as it was for Descartes. The natural light is the, the natural light of our clearing, our disclosure. And at the beginning of this paragraph on curiosity, he, um, he cites the opening words of Aristotle's metaphysics, when uh, Aristotle says, all men by nature desire to know. An indication of this is the delight we take in the senses and above all, the sense of sight. We prefer seeing to anything else. Interesting phrase. Um, we take delight in the senses, we take delight in sight. And this is um, a kind of curiosity, a kind of, if you like, philosophical curiosity that human beings have. But things get um, turned up a little bit you know, the volume control goes up a tiny bit in the next paragraph because Heidegger begins to quote St. Augustine. You know Augustine, the nightclubber who becomes a bishop. And Augustine is, talks about, in the Confessions, about what he calls concupiscence. Concupiscence, not a word that's used very much these days, concupiscentia which means concupiscence of the eyes. And this is the meaning of curiosity. And in Augustine, that concupiscence, that curiosity, is linked to uh, lust, and in particular, sexual desire, scopic desire, voyeurism, things like that. And if we open our copy of Confessions, and I've got uh, my copy, in my hands as I speak to you, and I'm going to page, into, into book 10 
of the Confessions. And in book 10 of the Confi Confessions, uh, there's a chapter called Empty Curiosity and Frivolous Interests. Gives you an idea of the tone here. And he says, this is Augustine, seeing belongs properly to the eyes. Seeing belongs properly to the eyes. You know, harkens back to that quote from Aristotle. But the problem of, of seeing for Augustine is the problem of sense experience in relationship to the concupiscence of the eyes, the way in which curiosity takes us in, sweeps us away. We become tempted with our eyes. We experience um, what Augustine calls lust of the eyes. Augenlust is the way Heidegger translates it. I lust. And we kind of know, you know, what this means, I think, in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, but let me quote another little bit from um, paragraph 35, when Heidegger says, when curiosity has become free, it concerns itself with seeing, but just in order to see. It seeks novelty only in order to leap from it anew to another novelty. Right? So what he's saying here is that curiosity as this concupiscence of this uh, where we're tempted with the eyes seeks novelty. It wants newness and it wants new things all the time. It wants to go from novelty to novelty, to be constantly kind of outside of itself, uh, distracted. So curiosity, Heidegger says, is a specific way of not tarrying alongside what is closest. In not tarrying, curiosity is concerned with the constant possibility of distraction. Heidegger says distraction. Curiosity has nothing to do with observing entities and marveling at them. And he quotes the Greek here, thaumatsein, wonder. This is not what is meant by curiosity. Curiosity is rather a constant distraction by things. It has nothing to do with wonder, amazement at the existence of the world, rather curiosity is the experience of never dwelling anywhere. It's a loss of dwelling, of being everywhere and nowhere. So curiosity is the experience of constantly uprooting ourselves because we're distracted by some new thing that comes along. And um, Heidegger ends this paragraph by saying, curiosity, for which nothing is closed off, an idle talk for which there is nothing that's not understood, provide themselves with the guarantee of a life which is supposedly, is genuinely lively. A life which is supposedly, genuinely lively. Uh, I think about this in a number of ways, or well, maybe at least two ways. I think about Hedda Gabler, Ibsen. Hedda, bless her, love Hedda, um, wants liveliness, she craves liveliness. Unfortunately, she finds herself with a husband who's not lively and who bores her to death and who's not gonna deliver the kind of life that she wants. And so she engages herself with other desires, other curiosities, other men who cross her path. And she craves liveliness until she slips away into a side room, begins banging away on the piano, takes out her father's gun and shoots herself through the head. Now, I'm not saying <laughs> don't be curious on that basis, but uh, she wants liveliness, and maybe liveliness is something we should be a little bit suspicious of. The other thing I think about in relationship to curiosity is about uh, flirtation. That curiosity is very much the life of flirting, the play of looking, being looked at, the kind of seduction of looking. Um, so if we wanted to find a phenomenology of the sexier or phenomenology of flirtation in, in Heidegger, we could look at this paragraph. Heidegger, Heidegger's gonna do no such thing, but doesn't mean somebody else might not do it. 
Anyway, ambiguity, the third concept in this little, this little trilogy. When everything is always already understood and everyone talks about it all the time, it becomes impossible to decide what is disclosed in a genuine understanding and what is not. Everything becomes ambiguous. Everything becomes ambiguous. Things look as if they're understood, but they're not. Everyone is acquainted with everything, but they understand nothing. Heidegger says on page 218, but when Dasein goes in for something in the reticence of carrying it through, or even a genuinely breaking down on it, time is a different time, and as seen by the public, an essentially slower time than that of idle talk, which lives at a faster rate. So reticence, which we saw in the last episode, which Heidegger likes, reticence is slow. It's a slowing down of time. Idle talk is fast. If we go back to the, the reticence bar in Helsinki or imagine its construction in Brooklyn or something, then this would be a slow bar, uh, whereas idle talk is quick, it's fast. Now, I find these uh, discussions in Heidegger pretty interesting. He goes on the same paragraph to say, Dasein does, um, Dasein's understanding in the they is constantly going wrong in its projects. That is to say, in its public disclosedness of being with one another, where the loudest idle talk and the most ingenious curiosity keep things moving, where in an everyday manner, everything is happening. This ambiguity is always tossing to curiosity that which it seeks, and it gives to idle talk the semblance of having everything decided in it. So these three elements, idle talk, chatter, curiosity, constantly being engaged by whatever it is that passes in front of my, your, one's eyes, and ambiguity, the fact that everything seems to mean this and seems to mean something else, these three things feed off each other, run together. We can think about this in relationship to, uh, you know, kind of where we are socially and politically, you know? Everything seems to mean something else. This is ambiguity. Or, you know, people say it's this, but actually it's this. You know, people say it's climate change is real. Other people say it's a conspiracy created by China, whatever it might mean. We've, we, we see in the you know, allegedly developed countries of the West a politics of ambiguity, which is being used for a, an arguably malicious intent. So ambiguity is a constant watching of one another, listening to gossip and overhearing, where being with one another is really being against one another. Heidegger says, so there's a kind of superficial sociality of ambiguity where secrets are exchanged, people listen in, and people seem to be for one another, like being, like at a party or something where people are for one another. But then just beneath the surface, there is a, a hostility to each other. Someone like Heidegger will say, everything is understood, everything means something else, and everything and everyone flips around into something else. There is no constancy in this average, everyday world. So those are the three concepts. And then we're now in the final pages of chapter five. You'll be pleased to hear. And um, he's going to pull all of this together in a fascinating couple of pages called Falling and Thrownness. So these three everyday ways of inauthentic being there, idle talk, curiosity, ambiguity, make up the falling of Dasein. And this falling is the being of everydayness. And Heidegger insists um, that this is not negative. This term falling does not express any negative evaluation. Falling is being lost in the publicness of the they-self. It is absorption in the world. 
It is falling to the world. Again, falling not as a vertical descent from a state of grace so as to a state of sin, like Satan falling from heaven to hell, but falling to the world, falling at the world. Heidegger insists, and rightly, that this inauthentic way of being does not mean not being in the world. Rather, inauthentic being is a distinctive way of being in the world, which is completely fascinated with the world. Heidegger insists that this is a positive possibility, that falling is a positive possibility. So falling, Heidegger insists, maybe insists too much, is not bad. He then picks out, let's see, how many are there? I think there's one, two, three, four, five ways of characterizing this movement of falling. And these characteristics are that falling is tempting, tranquilizing, alienating, entangling, and turbulent. Tempting, tranquilizing, alienating, entangling, and turbulent. And let's take them in turn, because um, they're pretty interesting. Idle talk discloses to Dasein a being towards its world, Heidegger says. And Dasein is pulled by that world. Dasein is tempted by falling. Being in the world, he says, this is on page 221, being in the world is in itself tempting. Being in the world is tempting. We float groundlessly in average everydayness and we're tempted towards falling. But he goes on. This, this tempting, insofar as life with the they allows for a full and genuine life, and we live in the certainty and the decidedness of the they, we find what Heidegger calls tranquility. This is interesting, tranquility. So we're tempted by being in the world, we're pulled into falling, and that pulling into falling it has a tranquilizing effect. On page 222, he talks about a full and genuine life brings Dasein a tranquility. Falling, being in the world which tempts itself, is at the same time a tranquilizing. I think of this in you know pharmacological terms, in terms of the rise of tranquilizers and Xanax and things like that, which kind of numb you to the world as a way of getting through it. The third element in this picture of falling is um, alienating, alienation. Heidegger talks about the way in which um, Dasein in average everydayness, he says, the opinion may now arise that understanding the most alien cultures and synthesizing them with one's own may lead to Dasein's becoming for the first time thoroughly and genuinely enlightened about itself. This is uh, interesting. What he's suggesting here is that an interest in foreign cultures, you know, in foreign cultures is a way of inauthentically becoming enlightened about ourselves. The way in which, say, in developed Western cultures, there's a kind of fetishization of the non-Western. A fetishization of the non-Western which leads to a kind of exoticism. This is what, um, what Nietzsche used to call European Buddhism. The fact that we can, you know, our Judeo-Christian heritage has, uh, has messed us up and the, the answer lies elsewhere in uh, alien cultures, foreign cultures, and we can synthesize those cultures with our own. For Heidegger, this, is, uh, this leads to mere exoticism and it's to be, I think, um, understood as inauthentic life. The what would be on the fourth element, I think it is now, alienating, is that 
He says, when Dasein, tranquilized and understanding everything, thus compares itself with everything, it drifts along towards an alienation in which its almost potenti potentiality for being is hidden from it. Fallen being in the world is not only tempting and tranquilizing, is at the same time alienating. So tranquilized falling into or out the world is alienating. It alienates us from our almost potentiality for being ourselves, Heidegger says. Yet, and this is the last, the fifth element of, of falling, yet this alienation leads to entanglement. Heidegger says a very interesting thing here. He says, yet this alienation, this alienation cannot mean that Dasein gets fatically torn away from itself. On the contrary, this alienation drives it into a kind of being which borders on the most exaggerated self-dissection. The most exaggerated self-dissection. This alienation closes off from Dasein its authenticity and possibility. The alienation of falling, Heidegger says, at once tempting and tranquilizing, leads by its own movement to Dasein's getting entangled in itself. So, the alienation which Heidegger's talking about does not mean that we, Dasein, get fatically torn away from ourselves, just that. It means that we become entirely preoccupied with ourselves in the form of an exaggerated self-dissection. Now, although Heidegger doesn't say this, I think about, I think this could be understood in relationship to um, a concept, like a concept you can find in that lovely old curmudgeon, Philip Reef, where he talks about the triumph of the, the triumph of the therapeutic. That whatever the truth or falsity of psychoanalysis, and we could debate that, for weeks at end, on weeks at a time. That um, psychoanalytic theory has led to a culture of therapy, and a culture of therapy which leads us to become completely entangled with ourselves, preoccupied with ourselves, committed to some idea that there is um, some story about us, a story of trauma, of abuse, of victimization, whatever, however that's, however that's understood. So for Heidegger, this um, tempting, tranquilizing, alienating structure of, uh, of average everydayness leads to an entanglement in ourselves. And then um, this all has the characteristic of groundless floating for Heidegger, kind of a groundless floating, that we are floating in average everydayness, but we're floating in such a way that we're kind of caught up in the turbulence of uh, being in the world. So Heidegger says, this is on page uh, 223. He says, uh, falling is uh, not only existentially determinative of being in the world, at the same time, turbulence, turbulence makes manifest that the thrownness which can obtrude upon Dasein in its state of mind has the character of throwing and of movement. So we're yeah, like corks in a stream, leaves on a lake, I don't know, we're, we're kind of caught up engulfed by the turbulence of the world that surrounds us, that pulls us this way and that. And uh, we can think about our lives as, you know, living concretely, living our best lives ever, ascending, being happy, living in the present, whatever that means. But for Heidegger, this is the groundless floating of falling being in the world inauthentic falling. And this is the structure of what Heidegger calls thrownness. These elements that we've identified, 
temptation, tranquilization, alienation, entanglement, and turbulence make up the structure of thrownness. And the key thing, the key takeaway from this, uh, the end of this chapter, which links to um, what I was saying two episodes back, Dasein is thrown projection, is the phrase that Heidegger introduces here on page 223. Dasein exists factically. So we are always thrown. We are always in the movement of falling. We exist factically. And for as long as Dasein is, it remains in the throw, in the turbulent movement of thrownness. But if that's true, then how do we um, change direction? What about authenticity in relationship to that? And this picks, on, picks up on something that we've talked about uh, a couple of times before. The last paragraphs of chapter five, Heidegger talks about authentic existence is not something which floats above falling everydayness. Existentially, it's only a modified way in which this everydayness is seized upon. So we are thrown being in the world, always already, average, everyday existence defined by idle talk, curiosity, ambiguity. Um, yet, because we are the kind of beings for whom being is an issue, uh, we can seize hold of that everydayness in a different way. Even in the mode of inauthentic life, we can modify that. Uh, we can seize hold of that in a different way. And that seizing hold of it is the possibility of authenticity. Heidegger says, a tiny bit further on, he says, falling is not a night view of Dasein. Interesting expression, it's not a night view of Dasein. Rather, it reveals an essential ontological structure of Dasein. It is the human being's movement, its kinesis, it's the structure of every day. It is daytime, like daytime TV. It's daytime, it's not a night view. So we are always already falling at the world, always already captivated, fascinated by average everydayness, caught in its movement of ambiguity, curiosity, and chatter. And all the authenticity would be, would be a change of movement, a modification of movement. The question is, how um, are we to conceive of that? How, or rather, how are we to conceive of that? How is that going to be felt? How is that going to um, take shape, take, um, take form, take a concrete form in, in Dasein's existence? And that's gonna turn on the next concept, big concept we're gonna introduce in, um, in these, uh, these episodes, which is the concept of anxiety, angst, which will be at the center of what we do next time. But just to, you know, summarize for a second, we've now gone through the first five chapters of Being in Time. Uh, it's been a lot of fun, I'm sure you agree. With all of the concepts that we've analytically delineated so far, we now have everything in place in order to get to a definition of care. And care is going to define the being of Dasein. And that's what we're going to do next time. Chapter six of Being in Time is called Care as the Being of Dasein. And we'll get into that next time. So thank you very much.